What's up, Crew Group Podcast listeners? This episode is brought to you by PIN, an AI-optimized recruitment solution from first contact to scheduled interviews. Use code CRUITGROUP in all caps to get 10% off your first month. This episode is also brought to you by Wags & Wine, the ultimate subscription box for the dog-crazed wine enthusiast. Use code WAGS50 for 50% off your first box. I'm, I'm at the top of my class and you didn't get me a job. You know getting jobs fine, but you're going to wish you would. Think of that. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Crew Group Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Levy, here with another special guest, my friend, serial entrepreneur, and sales machine, the one and only Alex Sancool. How are hey. you, Alex? All right. There we go. Well, uh, we talked before we got on the show. Uh, I go by Alex Sancool. That is my given name. But if you want to throw the Alex Sanducal out there, I, I will not be offended. But uh, yeah, man, great to be here. Long time friend. We, we met in high school. Yes. Uh, we went to college together. We're in the same fraternity. And now we're both running multiple companies. Look at how the world has come full circle. I know. It's, it's crazy. I, I appreciate you giving the, the context there because I was going to give the backstory, but you saved me a few words there. Know you a long time. And um, yeah, had some really good times together in college. We hadn't talked in a while. It's been a while. I know we're connected yeah. on LinkedIn and interact once in a while and all that. But we had lunch together last week, and I could have talked to you for like four hours, man. It was that was really a great good time to catch up. Yeah, it was really good. And now well, our, it's our, hard. Our it's hard not to. Yeah. When, when you when you're at the outback, you know, when you're at the outback and you're splitting a blooming onion, okay, that's where you know that's where you just reconnect. That's 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 where the magic happens. Yeah, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself. What says Florida more than a, a nice little lunch date at Outback Steakhouse amongst right, men? Man. There you go. <laughs> oh man. So Al, you're you're a serial entrepreneur like myself, but let's let's dial it all the way back. I said you're a sales machine. So essentially you you started your career in sales, right? Walk us through that. Sure. Well, I mean, if we go all the way back to uh to college, which is where you and I shared some history. Uh, my first sales gig was, uh, well, I was an intern at Cumulus Radio and I sold advertisement for the radio. I, I think I did that my junior year. And then my senior year, I sold the FSU phone book back when that was still like a thing. And now I sound like one of those guys like, well, back in my day when I was doing door to door, but actually there was a phone book and we sold it and it was us versus all the other, it's like 250 colleges that sold this phone book and this planner and this text, text message thing. So I led a team of four salespeople. That was my first okay. time in really like professional sales and leading a team. I got selected as the team leader. We went up to North Carolina and we had like a two week uh, full blown sales training. It was an amazing internship. Um, and uh, we went to bat. It was a full summer, three months. And uh, it came down to us versus the University of Florida for the top spot in the nation. And on no the way. last day, I sold this tire shop that was just like, you know, it was, I had been working on this guy all summer and I finally was like, look, man, I, I need you to, I need you to get in this phone book so we can, <laughs> you're not, you're not a Florida fan. This is Tallahassee. So we got the deal done. It put us over the edge. So we were number one sales team uh, in the nation. And I think from there on out, I was like, okay, uh, sales is fun. I can do this. And I, I, I think from that experience though, I really enjoyed the team aspect. And I think if you look at any of the companies that, I've either own, run, or been involved with. Uh, it, it always comes down to the team, and I think we obviously shared a lot of that camaraderie back through uh, the fraternity. And I even own, you know, another business with a fraternity brother. But um, I, I think that's what's been really fun about sales is I look at it very much as a team sport. And uh, you know, so that's that's where I caught the bug going all the way back to college. Okay, and I guess growing up, before we get into more of your sales. Did you have that entrepreneurial itch when you were younger? Like, were you the type of kid that was mowing lawns, washing cars, going to garage sales, anything like that? Typical entrepreneur story. Tell us more about that. A absolutely. Well, you know, actually, you can see my red Gibson SG back there. Yep. Uh, so that guitar I got when I was 13 years old and I mowed lawns for two years 
to save up for that guitar. So that was my goal, right? Is I, first of all, and you also see my little figurine of uh, Angus Young back there. I wanted to be Angus Young from ACDC and he played a Gibson SG, which was like $1,400, which might as well have been a million dollars to a 13 year old kid. Um, so I started mowing lawns uh, and I did that, you know, for two years and uh, saved up enough money. And I finally got the guitar and it, it was it was a huge accomplishment. So now I keep that in my office as a reminder that hard work does pay off. And it's a little it's a little memento. And um, so I think that was my first, I guess, if you will, my first business uh, was lawn mowing and then, you know, all kinds of different stuff after that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I've I've always been interested in just business in general. And I think, right. you know, especially when you think about sales, at least th this has always been my opinion. And it, it, I, it's not like I woke up one day, but I've always considered myself a businessman uh, or a business person. And a, you know, sales is just a part of that. And I think when that switch happened, I don't know when that was, when I started thinking about things, whether I'm in a sales interaction or then, you know, running companies, um, I have thought of myself as a business person first. And then when I'm talking to a prospect, it helps me put myself in their shoes. And you start to think about things like, wow, what is what I'm selling actually going to impact their PL and their right. cash flow? Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters here. And I think that was a big, that was a big turning point for me in my career. Um, and you know, it all started mowing lawns, wanting to be Angus Young, buying a guitar. So there you go. I love that, man. You know, I never even thought about this. This, this was on the spot here. Uh, Cause I, I always wonder to myself, when, like when I was growing up, I was the same way. Like I was mowing lawns, washing cars, doing whatever I could for 20 bucks to buy baseball sure. cards for me. Sure. You know? So it's, it's similar. Uh, or I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a similar like upbringing. Right. Um, so it's just curious, but let's fast forward a few years. You spent six years at next tech systems here in the Tampa Bay area started in account management, worked your way up into leadership, and then ultimately left to go to an organization called InSync Healthcare Solutions, correct? Yep. So tell yep. us a little bit more about InSync. And I, I kind of want to start there because ultimately the company was acquired and you were part of all that process. But talk yep. to us about your journey at InSync. Well, you know, coming out of college, I started my first uh, tech startup uh, and was there for six months and really got a crash course uh, into what it's like to work directly with the founder, grow the business from the ground up. Uh, then I started my own podcast network, ran that for three years while I was also working at Next Tech. And then uh, at Next Tech, uh, we went through an acquisition, actually a couple of them. So I kind of got to see a little bit behind uh, the curtain of, of how that process worked. Um, and then I knew, though, I wanted to build my own team and I also wanted to build a company. Um, but I knew kind of where I operated best was not um, from idea or inception uh, to, you know, first dollar. I knew I was more of a growth accelerator. So mm. I just knew some of the, uh, you know, the president, the owner of InSync Healthcare through my mutual network. And they said, hey, Alex, why don't you come over and check out what we got going on? It was an electronic medical record company. Uh, it's, uh, it was completely self-funded. They had about $6 million of legacy revenue. Um, they were selling perpetual licenses at the time. So I went over and uh, there was about, I don't know, seven people in the building, not a whole lot going on. Uh, and, but I, I, what I saw was it was an opportunity because they had a great product. They had an awesome product. Uh, they had decent implementation and support. And I knew that what I had in front of me, uh, a lot of people would look at it as like, this is, this is crazy. I mean, I was doing great at next tech, um, had all, all kinds of great stuff going on. Um, but I felt like, you know what, this is this is like a, a dragster fueled up on the starting line and they just need somebody to come in here and really push the gas pedal. Right. Um, so I took that leap of faith and went in and, and one of the one of the big caveats was, look, if I'm going to come in, you guys got to let me do this the way that I believe um, it can be done, really build out uh, the revenue machine here. And to their point, uh, it, it was uh, myself and then three other partners. They really gave me the latitude to do that. Um, so this was 2017, early 2017, um, and no uh, first sales rep. And then I, uh, I said, look, why don't why don't you let me hire what are called business development representatives? They thought, right. well, telemarketing's been around for a long time. No, 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 no. This is a different concept. Like it was a very, very uh, educational process uh, for the sure. ownership. So I said, look, let me hire two. Let me show you what we can do. And I think in the first. 90 days, we generated like $300,000. I was like, look, this, this works, right? This process works. Let's build this out. 
So uh, we grew a lot over that period of time, all of it self-funded, bootstrapped all the way through, which actually up until that point had also been the companies I was working with. And then afterwards, I'm very passionate about that. All the companies that I've owned or run have all now also been self-funded. Um, but you know, one of the challenges that we had at NSYNC, which really leads into Keystone, was, well, we need to do this without raising capital. We want to keep the cap table flat. We need to expand our sales, marketing, development, all, all the things here. And we were selling a perpetual license, which uh, was great uh, for our EBITDA and cash flow. Uh, it was bad for our recurring revenue valuation because we had none. So we knew at some point we were going to have to move this business to a true SaaS model if we were going to garner uh, maximum valuation when we went to sell the company um, okay. when, when we got to that point. So continued to grow the sales organization. And uh, what ended up happening is, is I went to the financing partners that I was using to finance these perpetual licenses. And I said, hey, guys, look, if, if, if I could sell a three-year subscription, could you finance it? And you pay me up front for all three years. You collect the monthly payments from my customers and you absorb the collections risk. So it took us a while, but we figured that out. And, uh, you know, the end result is we ended up growing the company to $39 million in revenue uh, in wow. five years. And in uh, December of 21, we ended up selling that business to Werber Pincus via a strategic acquisition by one of our top enterprise competitors, Qualifax. Um, and then I stayed on. I had a one year contract to transition the business and uh, we did that. Um, and then I exited when my contract was up January of last year. And then I started Keystone. Uh, which was then really a continuation on initially yes. of that financing model. But it really all came through uh, what I consider kind of necessity breeds innovation, right? And we needed a, uh, a, a cash flow positive model where we could still generate recurring revenue uh, and, and garner a top valuation. And along the way, I mean, I learned a lot about just overall go to market sales, everything associated with growing a revenue in a business. Yeah. And um, it was great. So we ended up growing that business to about 350 employees. We also had uh, about 200 employees in India. Um, and it was a great success. It was a great ride and learned a ton. Man, that that's a, a nice feather in the cap. That's got to be one of the things that you're most proud of in your career so far, I'd imagine. I, absolutely. You know, and I think it. Well, I think it goes back to the team. I mean, the, you know, going, I think there was a couple of things going through a acquisition process like that. I mean, there is just, well, first of all, when you're going through anybody who's gone through it, you're working two jobs at the same time, right? You're, you're, you're working your main job and you have to make sure that your numbers are up. You want the company to look as polished as possible. So you're, you're already running that sprint. And then you have this whole other job, which is working on, uh, selling the company and you're going through that transaction process. You're working with your investment bankers, your lawyers, your accountants, the other side, which in our case was our competitor. So as someone who's trying to eat their lunch and also sell the business to them at the same time, that gets a little precarious. I mean, there, there's so many facets that happen. So I think that was one of my uh, really, uh, I, I think a valuable takeaway that I took from that. And I, I think that experience was just I mean, I know I'll benefit from that experience for the rest of my career. But the number one thing I was probably I, I was most proud of is the team that I built. Several of them work for me now uh, and we work as a great team on Keystone. But we just built I know everybody talks about, well, we got a great culture. But man, it was phenomenal. It was so great. And all these guys who didn't know each other even before they came into the company, they're in each other's weddings, guys and girls. Um, some of them are even getting married to each other. And it was just it was an incredible team. Uh, a lot of uh, young, hungry people who uh, I was able to mold and were open to, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, their, their first or second career. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a blast. It was, it that's was awesome. Fun. I love to hear it. Two, two questions before I, before I move on here that, that came to mind. One personal question. Did you get equity? So yes, uh, that, that was part of that deal. Yeah, that was a, <laughs> okay. You don't have to give me any details. Just wanted to make sure that you got taken care of. Um, part I, two. I was taken care of. <laughs> Good. Sure. Smart guy. Smart guy. Um, part two culture. This was, this is not in a script, but part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is sell companies to candidates, right? Like, sure. And if I don't believe in the company and what they have to offer or the people or the culture, I don't, I don't want to represent them. Right. So like culture to me is very important. 
and you've been in these organizations where you've built the, co the company culture from the ground up in, in a leadership capacity, right? How, how do you build a good culture and, and what is a good culture to you? You know, <clears throat> I think, I think uh, in, in my mind, I think there has to be a shared vision and a shared mission. Um, I think everybody has to be, it has to be something that everybody can buy into. And at the end of the day, um, you know, regardless of uh, what the company wide mission or goal is, um, I am of the very strong opinion that you've got to you've got to also align your employees with what what is their mission? What do they want to do? What right. what is what are their goals in life and how can the current position that they're in? How can that move them closer? Or what can they learn from that? And I know that sounds like very esoteric, but I, I think that's it's always been a drum that I beat. And I think that's something that um, really fosters a great culture. And I think the signal of a great culture is one that uh, is not manufactured. And I think when you have team members who are they're growing and they're they're moving closer to their own personal goals. Yes, it's benefiting a larger company, which because again, remember at the end of the day, companies are going to, they're going to live, they're going to die. They're going to get sold. They're going to, they're, any, anything could happen, you know? Of course. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that almost self-regulating culture, um, if you can do it right, um, it's just, it's awesome uh, because it's great for performance of the company, but it's also uh, great for the performance of the individual employees because everybody is, uh, it's, not only do they feel that they're moving towards a shared goal, but they're moving towards their own personal goals. So I think that's number one. And anytime I would hire somebody, even today, one of my first questions is not, you know, what can you do for our company? What, what do you want to do? You know, mm -hmm. and it might not be what they want to do 10 years from now, but what, what are you focused on? What do you want to do today? What gets you excited? And if I have a position or if there is a role that helps uh, move you towards that goal or gives you that fulfillment, you know, that's you're already going to be playing a lot ahead of the field with that individual. It's going to improve your retention. Yeah. So that's always my advice with that is if you can get a culture that becomes self-regulating because you've got everybody who's not in it for themselves, but they're in it to benefit their future goals, which also align with the larger goal of goals at play with the company, then that's that's what you want to be doing. No, that's awesome, man. Well said. Well said. All right. So let's fast forward to today. You are the founder of KeystoneGrowth.com, which is helping founders grow to 10 million ARR without venture capital. Hey, -o. I love that. I love that, man. As, as a entrepreneur myself, I've gone into the VC world recently. And to say it has been an interesting experience uh would be an understatement sure. I, I so I, I now understand this world I don't, I don't really think it's for me so i'm all about bootstrapping i've bootstrapped both of the businesses i have today and i will continue to do that um but talk to us a little bit about what all that means well you know i think the first thing to level set is is i'm not anti-vc i am pro, <laughs> uh, i am you know i'm pro bootstrapping and self-funding and if it comes to a point where a outside capital infusion makes sense when the timing is right, uh, the, you know, you're, you're at an inflection point in the business. I mean, the, all those things could potentially warrant uh, not just venture capital, maybe it's growth equity. There, there's all kinds of different capital solutions. I think where, where I was very focused on and where we are, um, we work with founders. A lot of times they're in the founder-led sales stage or they're, they're small. Maybe they got a couple million dollars of ARR and they're either they're hitting that ceiling or they want to know how do we go faster or how do we, how do we get to the, that next level? Something that we are very focused on. And this is one of those where uh, I, I do, I am anti grow at all cost. Uh, I believe in growing real businesses that produce real cash flow uh, and sure. profitability. So um, one of the things that is a North star for us is rule of 40 um, and uh, profitable hyper growth, which I consider profitable hyper growth. When you think about hyper growth, traditionally, that means your business is growing 40% year over year uh, when you think about con compound annual growth rate, but also uh, a, a metric that private equity has been tracking for quite some time. And now what a surprise now VC is looking at as well as EBITDA, right? Your, your profitability and your EBITDA margin is what I, what I 
think about is if you're growing 40% year over year and you have at least a 25% EBITDA margin, which that is a very, very hard combination to hit. But if you can do that, in my opinion, that is a true unicorn. That is unbelievable um, to hit those types of metrics. So we believe in profitable hypergrowth and we believe that you can do that if, 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 if aligned the right way uh, without raising a substantial amount of institutional capital. So um, I think when, when, we, when we work with founders who are either contemplating, well, you know, what can I do? How do I get to 10 million? Because a lot of times, just in today's market, everybody wants to grow to 10 million, sell their business for 100 million with a, a 10x valuation. Okay, well, you know, in today's market in 2024, as of uh, July, you know, premium valuations are maybe 8x. Uh, they're more like sure. 6x. And it's, it's a very challenging market if you're selling the business, unless you have a fantastic business and you have great profitability, retention metrics, all these things that we think about. So it, it's, I, I think it's been interesting to watch the market. And, um, you know, a lot of founders, when you mentioned you're just now kind of, you were exposed to the venture capital side. Um, again, nothing wrong with venture capital. I think it was the school of thought, a different way of doing business. Uh, if yeah. you were talking to a company that had raised venture capital, uh, you know, before 2000, you know, 21, 22, uh, the goalpost was in a very different place than it is right now, uh, yeah, coming yeah. down from investors. Uh, it was, you know, grow as fast as you possibly can. We'll juice the company. We're going to hire a bunch of employees uh, because our investment thesis is predicated on we're trying to get this company to the next level, to the next round before our cash burn is out. And then we're going to either IPO or bust or, or some sort of massive acquisition down the road. And I think what you're finding out now is that a lot of these founders, which is why a lot of our industry is a little bit upside down right now, uh, the their, their goalpost has moved because oh, money yeah. is a lot more expensive now. And now all of a sudden, they're tr the, the investors are tracking more like private equity. They're looking at things like profitability, EBITDA, efficiency. Um, so now they've had to re-engineer the business, which was built a completely different way um, for a different outcome. So I think where where I kind of punctuate this is the last several businesses that I've been involved with or the businesses that I run and fund myself, um, we've always been focused on one thing from day one, and that is cash flow. Uh, we are focused on generating cash flow um, ourselves because we know if we do, we can control our own destiny and we can build a great long lasting business. And, you know, down the road, uh, if, if we decided to sell one of those, great. But if we did, uh, I truly believe that at that point, we would have built so much enterprise value over that period of time because we built a solid, long lasting business um, that, you know, the outcome would be uh, would be a good one. Yeah, no, that's a super, super interesting perspective, too, because in a way, don't you think in general, it's it's kind of like a good thing the way the VC world ha and, and fundraising has has kind of flip flopped. It, it just felt like there was all these balloon um, valuations and you know, companies with these outrageous valuations that aren't even profitable or are hardly generating any revenue, right? Like, is that real? <laughs> well, I think we're we're getting back to the basics, you know, and right. I, I I think, um, look, I, I've been in, in uh, the technology space for, you know, well over a decade, um, but I've, I think I've been fortunate that I've been in some other spaces that are completely unrelated to technology. Like I used to own a Jewish deli, uh, yes. I own a French wine importing business, things that have absolutely nothing to do with ARR and, you know, it, all, all these things that we think about and talk about on a daily basis. And, you know, when you're running, uh, I, let's just take a deli, um, you know, you got, you don't have the benefit of 70 to 80% gross margin like we do in SaaS, right? Mm -hmm. We, we have, we have 8% and that's if, uh, we didn't buy too much pastrami the month before or whatever, and that fluctuates in cost. So that was a big crash course for me and how to run a business where you're focused on margins, staff, labor. I mean, all these things that I, again, uh, I'm in the tech space, so I, it, it is what it is. But I think sometimes are taken for granted um, because everybody is very much focused on enterprise value and, and, and you know, yeah. selling a product that has massive fat margins. Um, but I think now what we're seeing is, to your point, we're, we're getting back to the basics. This is back to the basics of it is we're, we're trying to grow and run a profitable business that provides significant value to customers. Uh, and so that customers stay for a long time. And that, of course, that retention turns into 
you know, longer dividends through the uh, through the SaaS retention uh, in your subscription, which ultimately is going to translate into a higher enterprise value. So I think it's just back to basics. Yeah, no, I love that, man. All right. So say I am a I've, I've started a new SaaS company. I've been around for three years. We haven't raised any money yet. We're, we're just getting going, just getting some momentum. I'd, I've had trouble with VC funds, right? I just, just haven't found the right one yet. I'm looking for a direction here. I come across Al on LinkedIn. How does it work with Keystone Growth Advisory? Sure. Walk me through the process. So we do a couple things. Uh, we provide customer subscription financing, which is a form of alternative capital, uh, which is the same model that I used at InSync. So um, if you're a company that's been in business for three to five years, you've got you know five hundred thousand to a million dollars in revenue, and you're selling a you know a decent sized contract, let's say a fifty thousand dollar ACV or more. Um, and you want to use customer subscription financing to pull forward three years of that revenue today without using debt or equity, then we can help you with that. Um, the other side of the equation is uh, you're, you know, you're, you're at an inflection point and you're either a founder led sales organization or you have a small sales team or you're thinking about hiring a sales team. But you're also trying to figure out your go to market strategy, your sales execution, um, you know, that that aspect of how do you generate uh, more with less, right? right? That's the equation that we use all the time. Uh, that's really where we can step in. And we help in from a uh, consulting standpoint uh, and strategy. Uh, we also build a lot of uh, combined go-to-market and financial models. You're probably sensing a theme with me that it all comes back to financials, um, especially in a bootstrap business. So that's one of the other things that my fp &A partner and I do is that we will build the go-to-market strategy we will build their financial model. We will combine those into one model because I think it's really hard. And I think this is actually a mistake that a lot of founders make at every stage of growth <clears throat> is they think about, okay, well, now we need to grow efficiently. And there's all these different bogeys that we yeah. can chase, levers that we can pull for that. But if you're looking at that data in a silo and that's in a go-to-market silo and that's separate from your financial silo, you're essentially flying blind. You have no idea if you're growing efficiently or not. Because it needs to come down and it needs to connect to your cash flow and your PL statement. So we build those models. And then we also, which has been a lot of fun, uh, we kind of organically grew into um, full outsourced uh, sales for uh, B2B SaaS companies. We were asked for this by one of our financing clients. And uh, we're, we're not a meetings booking agency. That's not what we do. We, we actually own the entire enterprise sales cycle for one of our clients. So my execution team, we go in, we prospect. Uh, we facilitate the demonstrations and we close. And these are, you know, deals of at least $150,000 a year or more. And wow. that's been, that's been really awesome because I think it kind of, it helps us, you know, step out of just the consulting realm and we're yeah. in the trenches literally doing this all day, every day. So we're always trying to figure out where's the best data source. What's the best way to do this? How is it winning? And then we translate that back down to our consulting clients. So we've almost got this really cool kind of, test lab where we're just we're on the cutting edge and we're just we're we're, we're hammering it. we we have a revenue share so we only make money it's gonna ask <laughs> yeah yeah it's we we are completely uninterested in booking meetings that have no chance of closing we are on the hook to close business that's how we make money in revenue share um so we function as a full-blown SaaS sales team we also function as uh, consultants and the go-to-market and sales execution and then we also function as alternative capital providers yeah, that's super cool, man. I just picture you and like you and the boys in a boiler room, just sweating, just slamming phones. <laughs> well, you know, we keep it pretty frosty in here. It's usually around sixty-eight for a reason. It keeps us on our toes. But you know, look, I, I know this is probably a uh, a very uh, there, there's there, it's a divisive opinion of in office versus remote. Um, I am, I, I guess I'm the old codger that still loves in office. That's one of the first things that we did. We have this office here. The team is in here every day. And when you think about culture, it's just, again, just my experience when you are in office and you're in the team. And like you said, you're all in the same room and not even just in sales, but just in general, there are just things that happen, these micro moments that are really tough to recreate when you're remote. So yeah. Keystone, we're all in the office every day. And Yes, to your point, there is a fair amount of uh, you know us, uh, and I, I go out there too, you know, and we're we're you know dialing for dollars, and we're mar getting market validation, we're cold calling, um, and you know guys that have worked with me for six years, we're all we're all in there doing it, 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's the best way to get market feedback. So we're all, we're all in the trenches together. I love that, man. So for all the newer salespeople out there that are just relying on AI and emails and LinkedIn messages or whatever, cold calling is not dead. Can you confirm Al? Uh, it's, it's a hundred percent not dead. Here's the stat. Okay. If it's dead or not, we've done zero email, zero LinkedIn for this client that I'm talking about that we're, uh, we're selling their software for them again, end to end, not just booking meetings. Uh, in 60 days, we built a, uh, little over $2 million pipeline. And we're probably going to close a majority of that in the next 60 days, maybe 90 wow. days, all of that through phone call. And again, uh, do whatever works for you. Uh, this is what works for us in this specific industry for this client. We're selling enterprise, uh, you know, software platforms to uh, chief information officers and directors of ITs. But it is my opinion, especially for early stage companies. I was actually on the phone uh, this morning with an early stage founder. He said, where do I start? You know, wh what's what's the best way? And I said, well, first of all, you, you got to focus on getting your first five customers. OK, mm -hmm. and they're going to be your show ponies. Um, these are going to be the ones that are going to give you the social proof that you're going to leverage into the next one. From there, we talk about ICP, which I'm huge on ICP uh, and your target personas, getting that dialed in. But all of that, the best way to do that is to physically have conversations. I, there's only so much A-B testing you can do on an email. It shortens your feedback loop. And there's also just a lot of noise in email. Now, we still use email and LinkedIn. Those are channels we absolutely use. Um, but I, especially for a company, if I'm getting first involved, we need market validation. I need to have conversations with people. I need them to give me objections. I need them to tell me, right. first of all, your price is way out of the, or your competitor is killing you on this. I, I'm not going to get that if, I, if I'm doing it on an email. So uh, point, cold calling point. is not dead. And I think we'll probably actually see a resurgence um, in that um, as more AI comes out. But I think a lot of people say cold calling is dead, maybe. And I'm, I'm speculating, but uh, because maybe it didn't work for them. And <laughs> yes. it's, it's not... It's not just about let's open the phone book or here's a list of prospects that I got from any number of the data providers out there. Let's just start calling them. Uh, you know, that's not what we do. Uh, we have a extremely sophisticated process for getting on the phone. I mean, there's technology involved, there's strategy involved. And this was not something that we just came up with overnight. And we're constantly pivoting. Uh, you know, every day we're trying to get better data, better outcomes. So. Yeah, if you do it the right way, the cold, cold calling is just the vehicle. That's all that is. It's just the yeah. vehicle. You know, you've got to have the rest of the car. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. Now, I'm with you. Uh, re real quick on, on the cold call piece. Uh, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole on this because I feel like we could talk about cold calling and, and sales strategy in a whole other episode. Sure. But what what is the meat and potatoes of a cold call? Like, what makes a good cold call to you? Say I'm a new guy. I understand my business. Yeah, yeah. You know, let's just say you're you're working in staffing, you're working in recruiting, you're trying to get in with uh, Outback, corporate Outback. Yep. yep. Bloomin Bloomin Brands. Bloomin Brands. You want to get in? They're looking for a marketing manager. You're on the phone. Like, what what is what is it that you're that's making it a quality cold call in your eyes? Well, I think this comes from the top down. It, it starts actually before the phone is even picked up or yes. virtually picked up. Um, it actually starts with your ICP, your target persona, your list of those, and then your messaging. If you don't have those dialed in, your, your cold calls, whoever, the it could be the best rep in the world, somebody who's been cold calling forever, just a machine on the phone, they're not going to have the outcomes. Uh, if you have the right systems and you know who you should be talking to and the message that connects with them, and again, that starts from the top down. That should be done before you even hire your first BDR. If you have that dialed in, you can take a mediocre rep and they will put up big numbers. Um, once the rep is engaged, then what makes that rep effective on the phone? Um, if they're talking to the right person, uh, you know, there's, I mean, endless amounts of, uh, you know, cold call methodology and scripts and all kinds of stuff. I mean, we, we use different things, but, um, the biggest thing that I always suggest, especially for founders, um, or somebody who's early in their stage uh, of a career, you gotta stay loose. You gotta stay mm -hmm. loose. Um, we are, Human beings are animals first, and we can we can we can sense when someone's tense or when they're uh, upset, when they're desperate. So that's another reason why in our office, I mean, we're you know we have a good time, we have a really yes. good time, and that's designed for a reason. Uh, you, you've got to stay loose on the phone, and you got to remember to have this is a natural conversation. 
Okay. It's a conversation first. Now, again, there's all different kinds of methodology I could give you around the openers that we use and the way that we go through the script. And, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that you can do there, but staying loose is number one, following a specific process where your reps are not just trying to figure it out for themselves. That's a disaster because you're going to have disparate data all over the place. And a big one that I think I'm seeing most software companies or any company really realistically that miss this is they're not doing proper lead qualification. Okay. And what's happened is before when, you know, you take any number of the data providers that were out there with phone numbers or, you know, emails, or is that person still there? What's happened is the, like at InSync, I had a BDR team. So I had about at one point when we were, when we were in our last year, I think we had about uh, 25 BDRs. Um, and then we had about 18 account executives and I had other, you know, rev ops and all that kind of stuff. But I had also a team of seven human beings that were in our Tampa office and their sole job was to qualify leads and opportunities. And what does that mean? Is that person still there? Are they the right contact? Does the phone number work? Does the email work? So that way, my BDRs, whoever is in charge of cold calling or prospecting that person via email, that's all they do. That is okay. what their focus is. Now, um, I think a lot of people will say that's an outdated model. Um, that was an old Salesforce model. I, I you know, again, I, I'm just speaking from literally real life experience right now. Millions of dollars in pipeline, closing <laughs> deal. It works for us. Um, now, what I will say is that you think about where we come with technology. What's happened again, going back to the VC market, you've had a lot of rollback and cutback. What are the positions that are being cut? You're seeing a lot of BDRs being slashed, okay? And with that, what's happened is they push the lead qualification and even, Ryan, the, the lead sourcing down to the BDRs. I, I talked to a company uh, last week, uh, and this is a more mature company, just one that I know. And uh, they're like, yeah, no, they just, they say BDRs, you know, go out here, either Google the names or go on Seamless or whatever, find the, so, so now you have somebody who should be spending 100% of their time prospecting, spending 50 to 60% of their time sourcing and qualifying. That's a recipe for disaster. It also takes them out of that flow. So sure. there are ways though, that you can augment that. And I thought for a long time that there's no way in that qualification piece that technology or AI uh, could replace a human set of eyes qualifying that. And uh, I have been proven wrong. So the old codger has come out of the office. We've started using clay, which I'm sure pl plenty of people are familiar with, but uh, clay is a, uh, a piece of our tech stack that we sit in between our data provider and our CRM, which has helped us uh, really effectively augment and uh, expedite our lead qualification uh, compared to what I had human eyeballs doing. Now, is it 100%? Is it, you know, the 99% accuracy? No, but it gets me 75 to 80% of the way there at a fraction yeah. of the cost. So I think it's thinking about not removing those steps from your go-to-market motion, but finding out, again, how can we do more with less, faster, more efficiently? Um, but all of those things leading up to the person who's on the phone, again, now, you don't want a mediocre rep, but I'm just saying you, you do all that first and you will take reps and you will get them at a much higher output and performance level when you have that type of system set up. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's a good segue, too, because one of the questions I wanted to ask you is how do you navigate the ever changing enterprise world, especially as it relates to AI and technology? Well, you know, uh, I think the quickest way to light money on fire is buy a whole bunch of tools that you don't need. And I, I, I have fallen victim to that myself plenty of times. Uh, you know, I actually even just did, this is insane. I just did a subscription audit. Which again, we're, we're all, you know, we're, we're helping subscription businesses. I did a subscription audit. We've only been in business 13 months. Keystone. Subscription okay? box company owner here. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Well, I, I haven't even gotten to my personal ones. All right, that, that's a whole another thing. <laughs> same, talk same. To my boss, my wife, and that, that's going to be a whole different negotiation. But, <laughs> but uh, internally, I mean, our spend on stuff that we thought we needed was ridiculous. Um, I mean, I was spending at least probably, I mean, I, I would say at least five to $6,000 a month uh, for our size of company on things that just were, were absolutely not necessary. Right. So once we, we cut all that and I just went, all right, no, we're, we're going to slash and burn for the next two months and just see, do we really need that? 
And no, we, we didn't need that. So it all came down to the fundamentals of we need a good data provider. We need a sourcing agent. We need a, you know, a CRM. And then we use uh, a parallel dialer, which we may even switch. And that would be the thing that I would say is how do I navigate it? I look at every piece of technology and every technology spend that I have for any of my companies. And just like, you know, an employee, I, I basically have a performance review and they've got to earn their keep every month. You know, are they worth the money that I am paying for them or not? Are they making an impact? Um, yep. So I think there are absolutely tons of great technology tools. And it's always about comes down to the cash flow. You know, is there value there? So something that would save me two to three hours of time on the content that I make for a week because it auto generates the captions. Well, my time's valuable. That's worth the time. Uh, you know, something like Clay that replaced $150,000 in overhead. Yeah, that's worth it. You know, yeah. so I, I think it really just comes down to the time value equation. And like I said, put put your tech stack on its own quarterly QBRs or it's, you know, quarterly performance plan. Evaluate that every single month. It, they should be earning their keep. Otherwise, drop them. No, that's that's good advice, man. Um, another off topic, as you can see, I take notes during a conversation, so I know where to go back. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned founder led sales a couple of times. This is three years ago. I had no idea what the hell that meant. Now we uh -huh. specialize in the startup world and I work with a lot of startup founders. So to me, it's, it's an interesting, I, I guess you could say it's a dilemma in a lot of ways, right? Like uh, typically in the startup world, you've got like a personality type person, you know, uh, someone who's client facing or customer facing, right? They're the personality, they're, they're the, the face behind the brand, or you have like a technical led founder who's, yep. you know, the genius. Typically it's what you see, right? Uh -huh. But founder led sales, when, when would you say a founder knows it's time to bring in his first salesperson or, you know, I, I don't need to be selling anymore. Yep. Two, two inflection points or two, you know, uh, signals that they're ready to bring on their first sales rep. Uh, actually, there's technically three. First one, if that founder is so busy specifically with sales that they cannot breathe anymore, that's one signal. Maybe. Okay. okay. Number two, is there enough opportunity for a full-time salesperson? Again, go back to the BDR equation. Last thing you want to do is hire salespeople or a sales team and they're not busy enough because you don't, there's not always a linear equation to hiring more reps is going to create more revenue. What it will do 100% of the time is increase your cost, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate to revenue. So that's number two. Do you have enough opportunity for that rep to be busy nonstop? Okay. And then the third one doesn't make sense financially. Um, and I think this comes back to the business model. If you're selling a, you know, $1,000 software subscription total for a year, um, you know, first of all, we got to think about what type of go to market motion are you using PLG or are you using direct sales? But if you're using direct sales for $1,000, how long are you doing a demo for that? You know, how long are you spending on that? And to justify the cost of a sales rep, that means you'd have to sell like, I don't know, a hundred of those, you know, it, it, it so sure. I think the financials obviously have to make sense, but those first two, I think that's really where you have to think about when does it make sense? I think the, the mistake I see, um, is, Founders who say we're we're ready for we're ready to bring on a sales team or I'm ready to bring on my first sales rep, um, and because maybe they're not a natural salesperson. First of all, founders have a unfair advantage that makes them the best salesperson, regardless ever. I don't care who's in there, ever. Okay. Now there are certainly things that they can do to improve their demo, to improve the way that they uh, show pricing, but. I, I've worked with tons of companies. If you put a founder in front of an owner, now, again, it works better when you have somebody assisting them, of course, but they have the founder story. They have yes. the nuts and bolts of the product. And that is just there. That, that's just something that inherently you can try to transfer that knowledge. Yes, it can be replayed. So for those founders who are like, nah, man, you know, we're, we're founder led sales and I just I, I'm not a natural salesperson. You know, first of all, you got to make sure you have the three before you're ready to scale. Um, but you, you have more of an advantage than I think you you think about. And I, I think that's where another area that we come in and help is we help founders like, look, you've been in uh, capital raising mode and you're using your pitch deck as your sales demo. That's problem number one. 
You're not pitching mm -hmm. an investor. They don't care about your TAM and your enterprise value. They care, does your product <laughs> solve their problem? How much does it cost? And how long does it take to implement? So little small tweaks like that can really help. And then pricing and packaging. That's a whole nother one when you know you have a founder who is trying to present pricing. And yes, they're a, a, maybe a very technical founder. That that gets a little difficult. But again, some yep. coaching can help there. But again, it's those three, those three areas. Are they completely slammed with sales, sales specifically? Is there enough opportunity? And do the financials justify it? If they do, if you hit all three of those, absolutely. Go get yourself a sales rep or do something there where you're not creating your own bottleneck in your company and you can start to expand. No, that's good stuff, man. What uh, Obviously, you've dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs throughout your career now, and you've been an entrepreneur yourself. In your eyes, what makes a good entrepreneur? Well, you know, um, I would say being an opportunist, um, I think what I've certainly learned, which I'm still learning, and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, but, you know, neither. it's uh, I think it's just something I tell myself, um, which, you know, I probably screwed up a little bit in my past was uh, and I'm still probably doing is is not uh, not living in the present uh, enough and not. Uh, appreciating the journey that you're on and always looking at the finish line. Um, because, you know, if you're like me, sometimes you reach the finish line and then it's a, and then what? So, yes. what? you know, so um, look, everybody here is entrepreneurship is hard. You know, a lot of jobs are hard, um, but I think it comes back to even someone who's not an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur um, or, you know, just somebody who works for a company. Are you progressing in your own personal goals? You know, are, are you moving forward in life? Because, uh, you know, yeah, especially if you're you're building a company and all the financials are on you, everybody who works for you, their careers are on you. I mean, everything comes down to you. It can be a pretty crushing experience um, when things a lot of times don't work out. So I would say, number one is be present. Um, yes, it is important to have a long term strategy and have those long term goals because that's what helps get you up in the morning. Um, but, you know, be present. And appreciate the journey um, because Love at that. the end of the day, you know, it's life is going to be gone like that. And what are you going to do? You know, you're going to sit on your deathbed and say, well, I, you know, I hit this goal with with this company. Or you're going to say, man, I had a great time doing that. So easier said than done. But that's a tough one that I still work on every single day. Number two um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's not a very sexy answer, but someone who's focused on cash flow. It's, a, a, again, it's not a you know, again, not a sexy answer, but at the end of the day, your business most likely is going to take twice, if not three times as long and cost two or three times as much as you thought it would in the beginning. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, if you're not focused on cash flow or you don't have enough cash going into it, you're going to run out of runway or you're not going to have the flexibility or the agility, it's probably a better, the agility to pivot to profit, which is a motto that we have written on a board right out there. And I have it with all my companies, pivot to profit, because what you start the company might not be what you end the company. So you have to be an opportunist and you have to have yes. enough cash flow to, to afford the ability to have that agility to make those pivots so that, you know, maybe you make it to the end of the rainbow with a little cash in your pocket. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. I mean, that that's something I believe in. I've actually never heard the term pivot to profit, but I take a look at at crew group specifically. And I spent the first eight, nine years of my career doing purely tech recruiting and started crew group in, I think, January 2020, I believe was officially. But okay. uh, probably about two years ago, we pivoted a bit out of pure tech, like before all the mass layoffs. I was like, something's going on. My usual buyers aren't buying. I'm not. Yep. I'm not getting the warm and fuzzies. Like, let's see what's up, what else is out there. And we kind of moved into legal and sales and marketing. And thank God we did, man. Uh, we we tripled our our revenue in 23 from 22, and we're we're on pace to hit your 40 rule in 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 2024. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, but but it, it all comes. Thank you. But it all comes down to pivot to profit. I never even thought of it that way. You just you really just opened my eyes there, Al. <laughs> pivot to profit, baby. We've got a list of. We call it the Keystone Keys 
It's in this yes. huge whiteboard. Now we, we always add it. Now we got like 24, but that is numero uno on there. Now to the side, very adjacent is our popcorn ratings because we uh, we crush a lot of popcorn in this office <laughs> and we have different flavors. And there's always a huge debate over which one's the best. And there's uh, that's a whole thing. But number one, next to the popcorn rankings, power, popcorn power rankings, as we call them, is pivot to profit. Always on the mind. Amazing. OK, you answered the entrepreneur question and, and I think you're a hell of a salesman. But what makes a good salesperson to you? You know, uh, I think it goes back to the mindset like I talked about. You know, you're you're a, you're a business person. Yeah. You you have to understand the, the person that you're selling to. Think about if you're selling to me. Well, all this this diatribe that I've been on here uh, about, you know, cash flow and this and that. It's like, look, if you're selling to me, I'm thinking about does this help or hurt? My my cash position in the company is it going to help me expand? I mean, I, I'm thinking about this from a financial standpoint, and you know, especially in today's environment um, where everything is harder in the economic conditions, CFOs are involved in almost every sales transaction. I mean, every dollar is scrutinized. Whether you're selling to an individual, small business owner, or enterprise, doesn't matter. Financials are going to come up, and I think whether you're uh, it's your first sales job and you're on the phones cold calling or whether you're you know an account executive whether you're leading a sales team all of this i think a lot of this comes down to you know thinking putting your business person hat on first and it allows you to think about when you're having these conversations you can have the depth that you need um to to make the sale and i think the other thing uh that was a big game changer for me and one of the things that i you know have coached my team here, especially, especially since we were in the financing game is financial literacy. Financial mm -hmm. literacy is such a powerful tool. Um, I mean, look, even just taking a, a quick course on how does a PL work? You know, it, it, just simple things like that. Um, I think for salespeople, it, it just completely, it unlocks another gear. And yeah, you know, if you've been in sales long enough, you know, when you're, you're in the middle of a pitch or you're going back and forth, and you know, there's that point in the sale where something changes and you're like, oh man, I'm going into overdrive. What I'm saying here is really connecting. I got them. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you're in the slipstream. You're like, this is, yeah. And I have just found that myself, my team, we get into that slipstream when we're able to turn on the, the financial literacy aspect and we can have that depth of a conversation on regard. And, and we sell, you know, we sell software products, we sell consulting, we sell financing. I mean, we, we sell a lot of different things. I sell wine, I've sold pastrami, you know, maybe not as much, uh, you know, on the pastrami side, but still, I mean, people are thinking about him. I got to pay $25 for a huge pastrami sandwich. So it still goes back to the pocketbook. I will. Yes. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Especially if it was number one in Tampa, you would absolutely. Yes. But yeah, so I would say those two things, you know, really just put your business hat on and educate yourself on some financial literacy. And those are the two things that just can unlock, you know, major expansion in your career. Love it, man. I, and I definitely want to, I want to wrap up talking about wine, but one more question before, before we get into the Ooh. wine stuff real quick. Obviously a lot has changed in the economy, technology, all that, just in the last two or three years, in my opinion. Oh, sure. How has your sales process evolved just in the last few years? Yeah. I mean, it depends on, it, it depends on what we're selling and who we're selling it to. And I know that's a broad answer, but I'll give you an example. So think about right now. Uh, so let's, let's take the client that we're selling enterprise software for. Okay. And this is enterprise content management and, uh, you know, automation, you know, system automation software. I mean, it's, it's, it's complex. Okay. Um, I think there's always two sides of the equation when I think about the sales process. Number one, um, is this an education sale? And what I mean by that is, is this an established need within the organization that already exists like an ERP? All right. Every company needs an ERP. Okay. Every company needs a CRM, right? So now I'm just calling in saying I have a better CRM and it's at a better price. No education required. Okay. That's, that's right. number one. an education sale which is actually one of the ones that we, it, it is the one that we have right now is in my opinion, it is the hardest sale because you have to first educate your prospect as to why this is even valuable, why this is a need, why they need, what problems does this solve? Sure. Then number two, you go into, 
okay, now this is the economic equation here and this is what we're doing, right? Then you can actually get into the selling motion. So I would say one of the things that has changed for um, our sales cycle is we're always looking for how do we short circuit anything that requires education? Now, you could, of course, do that with content and there's always, you know, there's the content led aspect, things like that. One of the ways that we do it, and you know, we did this at InSync, and we were very successful with it. I call it our competitive replacement program. So, whenever we're looking for, um, you know, a group of customers that normally we would have to educate, but I don't want to educate them anymore. I need to go straight into sale. Well, what I do, what we do, is we look for who are the competitors that exist in our space and who are their customers, because mm -hmm. I know that that competitor, which generally is larger than us, they've spent more time, more money, more resources on figuring out that ICP. And more importantly, they've already spent all the time to educate them. And they've already identified someone who clearly had budget for this and decided to buy. So now when I go approach them, I'm coming to them with, I have a better product and I have a better price. I've completely cut out that first 50% of the equation where I have to educate them. And now we're in the slipstream. And now it's about, yes. you know, now it's about, I, I provide more value than your current, current provider. Um, so I think it's things like that that I think about now in this type of economic client climate. And, and just frankly, there's more software. There's more competition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm always hyper focused on how can I short circuit? How can I squeeze that buying cycle? And what can what can I do to shorten that sales cycle? And a competitive replacement program is, is a great way to do that with a tough sale like an education sale. Man, that's good. That's good stuff, Al. I love that. Great, great answer. There you go. All right. All right. Let's talk about how the hell you got into the wine business. Uh, so you have been in the wine business for north of five years now already. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you are a partner in Terre, Terre Blanc. Is that how you say it? Terre, Terre Blanche. It's French. Terre Blanche. Terre Blanche. I'm not a French guy. <laughs> Listen, hey, for the first year uh, with my business partner, I, I pronounced it the American way. Terrace Blanches. <laughs> um, until he eventually had to pull me off the side and say, yeah, Al, that, that's not, that's not how you pronounce it. It's French. It's Terre Blanche. Um, Terre Blanche. but, uh, yeah, we are, we are a French wine importer. Um, you know, that, that actually started with uh case in love. He's my business yes. partner. He was actually another fraternity brother. And, you know, he was, uh, he was, he was a recovering accountant and, uh, decided he wanted to get into the wine world. Uh, he and I would always, uh, you know, piggyback off trips that he would go to Europe and then with his wife, I go to Europe with my wife. We just really enjoyed that. And I, that's one of my hobbies is just European history in general. Yeah. So he got into wine and then I started getting into wine. And then one day, you know, he's, he's phenomenal. He's got, uh, I mean, his knowledge is incredible, um, but he's from Tennessee and he's got this really big Southern accent. So whenever you're in, yeah, whenever you're like in France, okay. And you got the Terrace Blanches boys from uh, the States. <laughs> And, you know, he's saying, hey, can you just imagine the bouquet on this wine? I mean, it it plays. It plays. I mean, it's like some Benjamin Franklin stuff, uh, you know. So anyways, he says, look, I, I'm I'm getting into wine. So he quits his accounting job, starts working in a wine shop. Then he works for Peter Wygant in D.C., which is one of the most prolific uh, importers uh, in America, uh, runs his shop for a couple of years and then finally gets to a point and says, hey, I think I think I want to do this. I want to import. I, I want to import like Kermit Lynch. Um, and uh, I'm very passionate about the types of wine that we want to bring in. All of them are biodynamic. And I'm passionate about low intervention, but also they're basically startups. These are husband and wife teams. Uh, we started with our first five at a Languedoc and Roussillon, which is on the border of uh, southern southwestern France and uh, Spain. It's more Catalonian than it is uh, than it is French. Mm -hmm. So he said, look, I want to start this. I've always wanted to do something with you. Um, I need a financing partner. So I finance the business and uh, run a lot of the business strategy. And Kaysen uh, brought in our first uh, five producers. And Amazing. here we are five years later. So we have a portfolio of 18 producers from all corners of France. He and I go over there a couple times a year, which is amazing. You know, you really get to spend a lot of great quality oh, yeah. time with your producers. Um, you stay with them. You're in the vines. You're on the vineyard. You're in the farm. Um, and then we distribute. So we import and then we sell through distributors um, in about 16 or 17 different states right now. We're continuing that expansion um, and they sell to retail and restaurants. So um, okay. we're, we're really we're really pleased. We're in uh, many Michelin star restaurants and even some of our wines have made it to the tasting menu on those. So I think it speaks to, you know, the quality of the, of the selection. Yeah. 
Um, but it's been it's been an amazing ride, and I think that's you know that's been a cool kind of uh, mental departure every once in a while for me uh, to step outside of the business that I run day to day and step into uh, the world of wine because yeah. it is just it's another planet. Um, and the, the, even the business conversations, and of course you're talking about international business at that point, right. um, you know, the, the conversations are different. The, um, the, the, the logistics are different, which I think a lot yeah. of people think when I say, oh yeah, we, we import wines. Oh, wow. So you spend all day on the chateaus. Like, no, not really. Uh, 90% <laughs> of our time is, is spent in a spreadsheet, uh, figuring out where the hell is our wine when it's in the middle of the Atlantic on a container. And, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of logistics, so it helps to have a partner who is a former accountant. Yeah. Um, but it's been it's been an awesome ride. It's been a blast, and our producers are just they're such incredible, hardworking people. And they're like I said, even with that business, I'm working with founders. I have 18 startup founders that I work with um, that just happen to be farmers who grow exceptional wine. You know, yeah. and uh, that's been a really cool experience. Yeah, it, it's small world that we're in a similar space and in multiple capacities. But uh, I think to your point on producers, I think that's probably my favorite thing about Wags and Wine for, for us too. I mean, when we first started the business, we didn't have our own wine label. So we went out there and created relationships with small boutique producers all around Northern California. And uh, just a really rewarding process, man, to get to know these people and break bread with them and, and, bring their products to the world, right? Or in, in my case, to to the US, but uh, on a direct to consumer side of things. But yeah, yeah it's just amazing, man. So uh, last last question on that. What's what's next for you guys? Is it French wines only? Do you want you know, to get into I, I think right now and we're, other things? Yeah, we're, we're focused right now on just, uh, we're expanding the amount of states that we distribute into uh, so that we get more exposure. And we're also just focused on uh, continuing to bring in the best producers that I think um, represent the terroir um, in the most authentic fashion. And uh, so it's not like we have a number of producers that we're trying to get to. I think a lot of ours that um, we brought in, we started early with them and now they're um, they're they're getting quite a uh, reputation, which is really in, in our end in, in importing. Um, I mean, you look at any of the big guys that have done it, Peter, um, you know, Kermit, um, they started off Becky, uh, they, they started with, you know, people who were relatively unknown. And then, you know, as they matured in their own winemaking and their wines got better and better, they got more sought after. And then it became an allocation game. And it's like, you know, you, you built these long lasting relationships, which yeah. is another cool thing about that, that, you know, many of these folks, it's, it's multi-generation, um, and there's multi-generational opportunities there. Case and I both have, he has two daughters. I have one daughter. You know, I don't know if they want to get into the world of wine, but I, I could certainly see this as a, a generational business that we'd love to do. And uh, we've already, you know, taken our families over there and vacation and visit our producers. And they're just incredible people. Um, and I think that's what's, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, your business and, you know, meeting these these folks. And I would say the the biggest difference that I have seen, which is why it's why I mentioned it's a nice departure is when you think about their product versus a lot of the products that either you're representing in uh, the recruitment aspect or, you know, I'm helping grow, you know, right. look, yes. Do they, do they, do they help people? Do they solve problems? Absolutely. But what is the measuring stick? The measuring stick is how much revenue did it generate? What's the valuation? I mean, it is a very, uh, you know, it, it's a very systemic measuring stick. I'm not saying that, um, you know, I think it's the way to go. Um, I think it's also a cause of a lot of burnout and a lot of, um, you know, unnecessary comparison, um, you know, but, you know, look, that's business, right? And there, it's it's king of the mountain and a lot of it's zero sum game. And a lot of that comes down to what I find. It's not necessarily who has the best product, but whose product, who's sold the most, what company's making the most money. Now, that is the measurement a lot of times of success in the business field that a lot of times that we operate. When you think about a wine producer, um, and I'm not talking about the big, you know, yellowtail, nothing against yellowtail, but I I'm talking about uh, really farmers, okay? Multi-generational farmers, vignerons, right? Yeah. Who are pouring their heart and soul into this bottle. And at least with any of our producers and when we taste with other ones, not once ever in five years has one said, you know, my goal this year is to sell 250,000 bottles. 
Not one. What they all have said is my goal is I want to make the best expression of Karen Yan in this vintage, or Incredible. I want to try this new combination. I think this would just be, I think this wine will be able to age for multiple years and it will be fantastic in 20 years from now. And so it's just a different, it could completely different mindset that yes. I think for me is, is quite refreshing um, that, you know, their goal is they just want to make the best possible wine that they can. And, you know, obviously they have to make a living um, and they'd like to be successful, but that's priority number one. And I think that that's what makes that business um, a lot of fun. Love that, man. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. <laughs> How do you prevent burnout? You mentioned burnout. See, you know, that that's what makes me, in my opinion, a good recruiter and a good salesperson. You know, I'm audible ready based on the conversation, based on the answers. My next question comes from that. So once I get in the weeds, man, I got I got a million questions. But you mentioned burnout and that's real in sales and it's oh, real yeah. in a lot of things, definitely in recruiting. But like, how do you, how do you overcome that? Well, I, I am burnout. I'm burnout right now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, full transparency. You know, I, I think it's. Uh, Me too. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. Let, let's we cut the bullshit. I'm sure we're both running our own businesses. We got a lot going on. There's a lot riding on this. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure we're both burnout. But I think yeah. it, the key is how do you manage that? And yes. that is something that I work on every day. I think a mistake I made, um, well, I already mentioned a little bit of, you know, not not being present and only focusing on, uh, you know, the milestone down the road. Now, look, with sync, look, I had a very defined goal and I had, you know, horse blinders on for five years to achieve that goal. And I achieved that goal. Um, and I completely, you know, my my mental health, my physical health, you know, completely went to to shit. And, uh, you know, I, I promised that I was not going to do that again. I made that promise to myself, my family. Um, but I think the big change for me was understanding that it's OK to be burnt out. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is it's impossible for anybody. I mean, my wife, who is an amazing mother, she's burnt out because our daughter's four and she brings home, you know, she's sick all the time, you know, from preschool. Yeah. I mean, everybody has a level of burnout. I think it comes to understanding and accepting that it is OK to be burnt out. It's now how do we manage that? So mm -hmm. when I think about, uh, you know, when I'm hiring somebody or if I'm if I'm trying to judge, are they are they here? You know, is this are they in the right mental space to handle this? I think it just comes down to, you know, again, figuring out what what are you what are you looking to do? What do you want to do? What's important for you? And more importantly, what gives you fulfillment? And I know for me, um, one of my pressure valve releases is the team. Uh, you know, and I, I know I've mentioned that team aspect a lot. Yeah. But it is just when I'm, you know, you, you've had these days, you're coming in, you're like, oh God, this or that, or this bill's due or whatever, you know, whatever's happening in your life. I know for me, if I come in and I've got my team here, uh, you know, we'll do something funny or ridiculous. And it's just that little pressure release um, that helps manage that. So I think when you're looking at a recruit or, you know, even companies, full companies can be burnt out, right? So oh, yeah. even when you're looking at that, you're thinking about what, what, what what's important to you? You know, what, what brings you fulfillment? What do you want to be doing? What gets you excited? Because that might be different than what it was a year ago, two years ago, or even a month ago. So where are you at today? And I think, you know, a lot of that is just sussing out like, all right, is now the right time? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a no forever, but is now the right time for you? Because is your personal development goal is that directly aligned with with where the company is you right. know? and the job? Most importantly, the job that you want to do. That's the other one that I would leave you with is um, I think people get burnt out again, thinking about, you know, where am I trying to get to and not trying to execute on where they're at right now? Like, for example, a BDR who only wants to get hired because they think I can get to an AE in six months. So I don't really even care about this BDR job. All I'm trying to get to is AE. And every month that I don't become an AE, guess what happens? You become more and more burnt out. Not because your workload has changed. Nothing's changed. Everything's yeah, the same. that's interesting. But you're not focused on executing the job that you were hired to do. And I think that still goes back to, yes, it is important to have goals. Yes, it's important to have an action plan to reach those goals. But it's also important to execute and try to get as much learning and experience and fun out of what you're doing right now today. And that's something, again, preaching the choir, I have to tell myself that every single day. Um, but I think that's a that's a big piece of it. That's awesome, man. 
that's uh that's a good way to close it out man it's it's been a fun conversation i uh, really appreciate your time it's great to catch up as always man and uh hopefully we will stay in closer contact now yeah and, uh refer some business back and forth you know absolutely <laughs> absolutely well we'll refer some bl- you know instead of uh breaking bread we'll uh we'll break some blooming onions okay yes you know, maybe we'll maybe we'll switch teams we'll go awesome blossoms i don't know but uh you know that's uh that's how we do it man we gotta stick together it's good stuff i really appreciate ryan for having me on here and uh congrats yeah. for all the success that you're having i mean it, it is no small feat um doing what you're doing so yeah you, you know, too man you too man awesome. Appreciate that. Where can people find you? So I would say the best one is on LinkedIn. So Alex Sandcool, uh, not related to Sanducal. So Sandcool, S-A-N-D-K-U-H-L. Um, and if you're a uh, SaaS founder in need of uh, go-to-market strategy, sales execution, or alternative capital, keystone-growth.com. That's keystone-growth.com. Um, yeah, check it out. And if we could help, we're happy to do that. And if you enjoy wine, if you enjoy uh, some adult grape juice, um, you know, we are in uh, 18 states. You can go to our website, uh, terriblanchewinemerchants.com and spell it phonetically, Terrace Blanches. And yes. uh, you'll find that. You can see um, all the different uh, states that we're available in. But uh, this has been great, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate your time, man.